Our scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with a child, and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Thank you. child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet, as shepherds watch our keeping. This, this is Christ the King. Shepherds, God, and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean estate? Where rocks and as are feeding, could Christian fear for sinners here? The silent word is bleeding. Their spear shall pierce him through. The cross be born for me. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins.
We are going to read from chapter 10 of The Stranger on the Road to Emmaus by John R. Cross. This chapter focuses on the promised deliverer, Jesus, and how various people played their role. First, we will focus on the roles of Elizabeth, Mary, and John. Before the promised deliverer arrived on the scene, God was going to prepare the Jewish people by sending a special messenger to announce the impending event. One can't help but wonder if the angels were in deep discussion over who this select bearer of good tidings might be. Would it be one of them? But then, News of a different kind leaked through. News having to do with the identity of the deliverer. It must have left all of heaven gasping. During the reign of Herod, king of Judea, there lived a priest named Zechariah, and he had a wife named Elizabeth, who was a descendant of Aaron. They were both righteous in the sight of God, following all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blamelessly. But they did not have a child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both very old. Now while Zechariah was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the holy place of the Lord and burn incense. Now the whole crowd of people were praying outside at the hour of the incense offering. An angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense, appeared to him. And Zechariah, visibly shaken when he saw the angel, was seized with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You will name him John." Joy and gladness will come to you, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go as forerunner before the Lord to turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared for him. The angel had told Zechariah that his son, John, would be the messenger to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. That was news, all right, but it was that last tidbit of information that had heaven all astir. God himself, the Lord, was coming to earth. He would be the promised deliverer. The news must have stunned Satan. No doubt, Zachariah was floundering as he tried to absorb all of this. Seeing an angel was unheard of in his day. And the news of Elizabeth having a son at their age was enough to give an old man pause. But then, to be informed that the Creator God was coming as the promised deliverer, well, it was simply unbelievable. However, Zechariah was familiar with the writings of the prophets. 400 years before this time, the prophet Malachi had written about this event. See, I will send my messenger, who will prepare the way before me, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, will come, says the Lord Almighty. There it was, in plain words. Zechariah must have wondered why he had not seen it before. It was obvious. The Lord Almighty had said, I will send a messenger to prepare the way before me. God himself would be coming as the anointed one. Moreover, the angel had said that the messenger who would prepare his way would be the priest's own son, John. 
Zechariah went home dumbfounded, and God kept his word. It happened just as the angel said it would. After some time, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months she kept herself in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me at the time when he has been gracious to me to take away my disgrace among the people. But a question must have nagged away at the back of Zachariah's mind. Just how would the Creator come to earth? Would he come in a golden chariot, driving seven white steeds, surrounded with legions of angels, all dressed in brilliant white? Would he unseat the Roman rulers, dump Herod off his throne? The angel had not said. Now let's think about the role of Mary. The scene now shifts. The angel made another visit, this time to a young lady by the name of Mary. In the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed or pledged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Joseph and Mary were engaged to each other according to their Jewish customs. The Bible says that both Joseph and Mary were direct descendants of King David, who had lived 1,000 years earlier. The angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled by his words and began to wonder about the meaning of the greeting. So the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Listen, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. What? Now it was Mary's turn to be speechless. When Mary finally found her tongue, she asked a very logical question. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Mary was to be the mother of the promised Deliverer. It all made sense now. Mary knew the stories well. Way back in the Garden of Eden, God had promised Eve that the promised Deliverer would be her offspring. It did not say their offspring, referring to both man and woman. Now the promise was about to be fulfilled and the child would be born of a virgin. It would be her offspring only. The baby would not have a human father. What had seemed to be an insignificant choice of phrasing now carried tremendous weight. But this little notation in the footsteps of history had greater ramifications. Because the baby would not be conceived by the seed of the man, the baby would not be part of Adam's bloodline. All descendants of Adam had inherited his nature, the sin nature. But Jesus would not be a son of Adam. Rather, he was the son of God. He would have the nature of the God Most High. No wonder the angel referred to the baby as the Holy One. The child would be sinless, just as God is sinless. Jesus would be perfect from conception. So, God would not be coming with all of heaven's pomp and grandeur, 
Rather, he would arrive on the planet as all mankind had and ever will, as a baby. The angel said, And look, your relative Elizabeth has also become pregnant with a son in her old age. Although she was called barren, she is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. So Mary said, Yes, I am a servant of the Lord. Let this happen to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Mary knew Elizabeth was too old to have a child. Surely if it was possible for Elizabeth to conceive, then it was just as believable for a virgin to give birth. Mary chose to trust God. Let's now focus on the role of John. Now the time came for Elizabeth to have her baby, and she gave birth to a son. John was born just as God had promised. The Bible says it was quite an occasion, and well it should have been, for in that day and age, a stigma was attached to those who could not bear children. Zechariah was so thrilled, he burst into a speech, a benediction of praise to God. What he had to say was really a mini tour of the world's history, punctuated with the repeated promises God had given over the centuries, the promise to send a deliverer. You can see the elderly Zachariah holding the child high, fixing his eyes on baby John's face as he said, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. John would be the messenger who would announce the arrival of the promised deliverer to the world. This is how Jesus was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Jesus, a Jewish pledged to be married implied a much stronger tie than our Western concept of engagement. In almost every sense, the couple was considered married. Joseph was called Mary's husband and vice versa, except they had not lived together nor had sexual union. According to the customs of that day, to break the engagement, a divorce was required. Imagine for a moment how Joseph felt. He must have been in anguish. Mary was pregnant and the child wasn't his. To reveal the truth publicly would label Mary for what she must be, an adulteress, unless Mary preposterous explanation about an angel appearing to her was right. No, that was absurd. The poor girl must be losing her mind. Joseph loved her, but he could not marry a girl who had cheated on him and was obviously trying to cover it up with an insane story. What Joseph thought about it all, we don't really know, but we do know that he painfully decided to quietly divorce her. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken of the Lord through the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means, 
God with us. Joseph could not have heard and it any more plainly. Mary was still a virgin and she was going to have a child. The child's name would be Jesus, which means deliverer or savior. He would deliver or save people from the conscious consequences of their sin. The angel said that another of Jesus' name would be Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Jesus would be God living in human flesh among men. The prophet Isaiah had written about this event 700 years before. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Joseph must have bolted upright in his bed. So Isaiah had been right. It was happening just as God said it would be. But what would everyone think? No matter. There is only one thing to do. He would believe God and do what he said. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus to register all the empire for taxes. Caesar needed money, and if the Romans got an accurate census, more people would have to pay taxes. It's doubtful that Joseph was happy. His wife was almost due. Being a carpenter by trade, he probably been working on a crib and had arranged with a local midwife for a clean, safe place for the baby's delivery. Now he was required to take his wife to Bethlehem, which is a thousand years before had been King David's ancestral home. A 70 mile 120 kilometer trip with a wife who might give birth any day was not a welcome thought. When you have to travel by donkey or on foot, why did the Romans have to come up with this idea now? Why not take the senses in Joseph's home? Nazareth, this was very awkward. But the, Ro the Romans weren't giving people any choice. He would have to take Mary to Bethlehem. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. So Jesus was born in Bethlehem, far from Joseph and Mary's home. The town was so crowded that the only place where they could find lodging was in a stable. Jesus' first crib was a manger, a trough for feeding cattle. As Joseph looked at his wife, it must have seemed like his careful plans had all gone wrong. Bethlehem, of all places, and in a, in a musty stable? But as, as he looked at the child, he must have sensed that everything was right, very much right. And he called his name Jesus. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in this town of David, a Savior has been born to you, 
He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The shepherds had been minding their own business, tending their sheep as they always had. Often sheep from their flocks were used in the temple sacrifices in Jerusalem, only a few miles north of Bethlehem. Life continued as usual, but now the angels had come and their whole world was askew. The shepherds might have excitedly queried each other, Did you hear what I heard? The Christ is the Lord. The Greek word Christ is the same as the Hebrew word Messiah. The word means the anointed one. For centuries, the name Messiah had been applied to the promised deliverer. And now the angels were saying that the anointed one, the Messiah, Christ, was the Lord. He was God himself. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them about this child. The shepherds were poor men, not the sort of folks that one would normally expect to be invited to the birth of a king. But there were others on their way to see Jesus. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. The Magi were men of status and wealth. Such men could be expected to visit a king. The king enthroned in Judah at this time was Herod the Great, who no doubt had been alerted to this rather prestigious company. They could hardly have escaped the notice of the sentries guarding Judea's borders. Their visit could not have been perceived as a threat as they were not leading armies. All they had was a question. Where's the newborn king? When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. That single question really rocked Herod. He held his authority as a king in a tightly clenched fist, and he would crush anyone who dared try to wrench it from him. No doubt the whole city was a little shaken as well. Herod was known to be cruel to his citizens, especially when he was upset. Who knew what he might do? Herod called his religious advisors. After assembling all the chief priests and experts in the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. You can see an agitated scribe blowing off the dust of a small scroll. His fellow sages bent over the pyrus and the remni eyes scanned the text. They're a little rattled. They want Herod to understand that they are not the ones who have said these things. A prophet by the name of Micah had written it over 700 years earlier. A shaky finger points to a well-worn part of the document. Herod disdains to look. A scribe clears his raspy throat and reads. But you, Bethlehem Ephratha, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. The baby must be born in Bethlehem. Herod wanted to see if the prophet Micah had recorded more. He had. It clearly said that the one to be born had lived for ever, from everlasting. Herod must have been ashen. It couldn't be. Only God was eternal. God would never come to earth as an infant, especially to be born in the backwoods of Bethlehem. He would arrive with trumpets and chariots in Jerusalem. Ah, perhaps the scribes were intentionally trying to alarm him, to manipulate him. It wouldn't hurt to humor them. He would show them what sort of worship new kings could expect. He shooed out his 
out as priests. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and myrrh. These men of wealth and status worshipped Jesus. The law was very specific. Only the God Most High was to be worshipped. Joseph and Mary knew the Ten Commandments, and yet they did not intervene. They must have known deep inside that the Magi were worshipping God, God who had come in human flesh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. Consistent with what secular history records of him, Herod did make an all-out effort to kill Jesus, but the child remained safe in Egypt. Eventually, Herod died, and so Joseph, Mary, and Jesus moved back to Nazareth, where Joseph worked as a carpenter. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him.
God who loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16. Merry Christmas, Merry everyone. everyone. Woo! Woo!
This is COVID Christmas. It will be very, very different from any other Christmas that you and I have experienced before in our lifetime. Ever since the news of the coronavirus broke out earlier this year, our world has been rocked by that news. The pandemic has gone from days to weeks to months, and it will be a year very soon since we first heard the bad news. With all the stress, confusion, and frustration caused by the pandemic, many people are hurting and struggling in life. But lest we forget, the circumstances surrounding the birth of Jesus also rocked the world of Joseph and Mary. It was not easy for them. They had to deal with bearing the reproach, the ridicule, the disapproval of their community, and perhaps even members of their immediate family. That, by the way, was a burden that they carried all through their lives, including the Lord Jesus himself. But keep in mind that all this was according to God's plan and was under his control. In the midst of pain, rejection, stress, and even the threat upon the life of the Lord Jesus, he came into the world to bring the good news of God's love. And so, tomorrow, despite our circumstances, let me encourage you to take the time to express very deeply your heartfelt gratitude to God for His many, many gifts, His Christmas gifts, forgiveness and hope, joy and love and peace. And all of these gifts, together with many other gifts that is given to us, are all wrapped up in this super mega gift of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As the Apostle Paul puts it simply and yet so profoundly, but thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. And so today we light the fifth candle, the Christ candle. Let me read again those tender words from Dr. Luke. In Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. While they were there, that is in Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there, were, there was no guest room available for him. To say the least, it was not an easy time for Mary and Joseph and even the Lord Jesus to be born in such conditions. And so despite the coronavirus, the fact that we cannot have large gatherings as families, as church, with friends, you and I can and we must rejoice and praise our Heavenly Father and celebrate the gift of all gifts, His Son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world, the Word made flesh, in order to save us from our sins and to offer us the gift of forgiveness and eternal life with God our Father. That's what Christmas is all about. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, what a time we live in. Our world is changing so fast, and the pandemic is adding to the stress and the uncertainties ahead. And yet, as Christians, 
we stand on the solid rock of Jesus and the unfailing promises of our faithful God who changes not, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In you, our loving, omnipotent God, we place our trust. In your sure hands, we commit our lives. Thank you, Father, for sending your beloved Son, Jesus, to save us from our sins and to change our lives forever. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. We, love, we live for you. And we will serve you with joy and grateful hearts all the days of our lives. Amen. And so let me say in closing, on behalf of Lorraine and myself, of the whole board of elders and deacons, we wish you a very Merry Christmas. And at the same time, we wish you a most blessed new year with Jesus, walking with Him, loving Him, worshiping Him, serving Him, and glorifying Him in all that we do. As we celebrate the birth of Jesus and rejoice in His coming to us, we light all the candles. We light the first candle, the candle of hope, the prophet's candle. The second candle, the candle of peace, the Bethlehem candle. The third candle, the candle of joy, the angels and shepherds candle. The fourth candle, the candle of love, the magi and wise man's candle. And now, the center candle, the Christ candle.